previously on Science IRL. And broccoli, you know we're gonna have to do a whole other episode about broccoli, because that's crazy. Well, this is that episode, and the time has come to reveal just how crazy that is. Are you ready? Here we go. Broccoli, cabbage, kale, kohlrabi, Brussels sprouts, collard greens, romanesco, broccolini are all the same species. How's everyone feeling? Is your world utterly rocked? Did you fancy yourself a kale connoisseur and now are questioning everything? <laughs> How can these very different plants all be the same species, you might be asking. Well, I've already been on this harrowing journey of vegetal discovery and come out the other side, and now I'm here to guide you through it too. The main way I made peace with all of these different broccolis was to think of them as dog breeds. If an alien visited Earth, they probably wouldn't think that a Great Dane and a Chihuahua were the same species either. Just like dog breeders, farmers have selected for different desirable traits to generate all these different varieties of Brassica oleracea. To truly understand what makes each variety so special, we need to learn a little bit about how plants build their bodies. But first, we have to throw out everything we know about how animals build their bodies because plants do it entirely differently. Plants and animals last shared an ancestor 1.6 billion years ago when all life on Earth were single-celled organisms, meaning that plants and animals evolved multicellularity independently from one another. So the way that we grow and develop and organize all of the cells in our bodies could not be more different because we figured out how to do it separately and have totally different rules. In animals, development happens before birth when we're embryos. Our liver and brain and arms and skin all develop when we're in the womb and we are born with all of our organs in their final place. Plants, on the other hand, are always going through development. If we look at a chicken embryo right before it hatches, we'll say, yeah, that looks a lot like a chicken because development is pretty much complete. But if we look at this pine tree embryo packed away in a seed right before it germinates, it obviously looks nothing like a mature tree towering above us in a forest. All it has are these baby leaves and a baby root. So plants don't complete development as embryos. They develop new organs like stems and leaves throughout their life starting when the seed germinates. Plants are able to do this because they have stem cells at the tip of every growing branch that allow them to continuously generate new organs. This is very different from animals, right? Our stem cells are used up once an embryo is finished developing. If we did it like plants, we'd be constantly sprouting new arms and heads and intestines. <laughs> it would be very messy. These regions of plant stem cells are called meristems, and they behave in a highly organized fashion. So this is a microscope slide showing the meristem of a coleus plant. The meristem is this little dome of teeny tiny stem cells right at the top. They have the potential to become any organ in the plant. The cells in the meristem are always dividing to supply the new organs with cells. As the older cells get pushed out of the meristem by new cells, they get assigned a job in a new stem or leaf. We can figure out the history of the meristem and what organs it's previously made if we look down the plant. So we can see here that it most recently made these itty bitty baby leaves. Before that, the meristem had made a little stretch of stem, and before that, it made another pair of leaves. This pair is more developed than the baby leaves because they were made a while ago and they've had time to grow. You'll also notice something interesting happening where the leaves meet the stem. There are new meristems forming. We call these axillary buds, and they are how a plant makes branches. Because they also have meristems, these axillary buds can start growing into branches and making their own stems and leaves. The regular behavior of the meristem leads to plants having a very modular system of building their body called the phytomer. The phytomer consists of these repeating products of the meristem, stem, leaf, axillary bud. We call the points with leaf and axillary bud the node, and the bit of stem in between each node is the internode. The meristem churns out phytomers in succession, node, internode, node, internode, and in this way the plant keeps developing throughout its entire life. Even though plants all have this same fundamental organization, they can generate the staggering variety of shapes and sizes that we see in the plant kingdom just by tweaking these different aspects of the phytomer. So that's how you get all of these wildly different looking Brassica oleracea varieties, by selecting for plants that have variations in their phytomer. Let's break them down phytomerologically. Is that a word? It should be. Let's start with the easiest one. Kale. 
Kale has got a pretty classic phytomer situation. We can see the repeating units of stem, leaf, stem, leaf, stem, leaf. And you know, you might actually think that these are branches, but this is just the petiole, which is the base of the leaf. And what do we find where the leaf meets the stem? An axillary bud. But you can see that none of these axillary buds are growing out into branches of their own. And that's because farmers want kale to really just maintain one primary stem that makes a lot of big, beautiful leaves. We don't want the kale to waste energy making extra branches because the leaf is the desirable part of the phytomer in this situation. In cabbage, things get a little more complicated, so let's cut one open and see what's going on with the phytomer. Nah, I'm scared. Just do it, Molly. Ah! Excalibur. Oh! <laughs> well, would you look at that? There's some crazy stuff going on with this phytomer. These leaves are so densely packed, and that's because there's like no elongation of the internodes. So the nodes wind up all smushed together, and you get like leaf, 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 leaf and it gets all packed together in this head of cabbage. And again, there's no branching because the axillary buds are suppressed. Another big difference between kale and cabbage is that cabbage leaves don't have a petiole. So the leafy part just attaches directly to the stem, and this helps all the cabbage leaves pack together more tightly because you don't have a big petiole in the way. Now at first glance, you might think that the exact same thing is going on in cabbage and Brussels sprouts. Almost, but not quite. In cabbage, all of the phytomer modifications are happening in the primary stem. But if we look at a whole Brussels sprouts plant, we can see that it actually has a pretty normal phytomer in its primary stem. We see internodes, we have big leaves with petioles at each node, and then we have the axillary buds. And the axillary buds are where all of the excitement is happening in Brussels sprouts because the axillary buds are what bear the same phytomer modification as the primary stem in cabbages. So in Brussels sprouts, the axillary buds can't elongate their inner nodes and they pack all of their leaves together rather than the primary stem like in cabbages. When we eat a Brussels sprout, we're actually eating a modified axillary bud. Kohlrabi may kind of look like a root vegetable, like a radish, but it has these big, enormous leaves with petioles coming off of them. So we know that this must be a stem because only stems make leaves, roots can't. Again, it's the primary stem that's been modified. Farmers have selected for the stem to become nice and swole. This is the part that we eat, but we can still really easily see the phytomer. So we have our node with our leaf and our cute little axillary buds. And then even with this swollen stem, we can still detect a little bit of internodal elongation. And then we have another node with an axillary meristem. To understand what's going on with broccoli, let's take a closer look at wild Brassica oleracea, the ancestor of these cultivated varieties. You can see it looks pretty similar to kale at the base, and when it starts flowering, we see a lot of internodal elongation and branching. Broccoli too makes pretty normal phytomers during its vegetative stage, and then it goes totally bonkers when it starts flowering. It loses its internodal elongation, it makes tons and tons of axillary branches, and it has a mutation to make way too many flowers, so you wind up with this dense and delicious head of broccoli. It's harvested before they bloom, so you're basically eating a broccolicious bouquet of flower buds. Hmm. Smells like broccoli. Cauliflower is similar, the mutation is just more extreme, so the flowers can never really fully form, and you wind up with that white, lumpy mess. I actually don't really like cauliflower, so I didn't buy any to show you guys because I have to cook now all of these different broccolis, and I didn't want to have to deal with a vegetable that I didn't like. Well, I'll stop there, but I hope you've developed a deep love and appreciation for the complexities of broccoli that you never before thought possible. I challenge you to figure out the phytomers of some of the other brassica varieties we didn't cover today, and let me know in the comments which variety you think should win best in show. Quick shout out to my professors, Elena Kramer and Missy Holbrook. This episode is based on one of the lectures that they give in the introductory plant biology class at Harvard. It's one of my favorites, and it was the first time I had learned about all this broccoli craziness, and it blew my mind. Don't forget to subscribe to Science in Real Life, have a brassicaceous day, and I guess I'm gonna go cook a bunch of broccoli now.